in, in uh, particularly upon verse 18 in the context uh, where the Lord says to Elijah, uh, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. Now, just before we begin, let me remind you what the Holy Spirit gives in Romans chapter 11 as the infallible interpretation of those words. So here we have in chapter 11, verse 4 of Romans, what says the answer of God unto him, to Elijah? Here's the answer. I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. So there it is. It's the exact recounting of the history. But now here comes the divine uh, and infallible interpretation of this. Even so, says Paul, at this present time, there, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. See that? A remnant according to the election of grace. He goes on, if by grace it's no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace, and if it be works, that's no more of grace, otherwise work is no more work. Now that's the infallible interpretation and explanation, really, of uh, 1 Kings 19, verse 18. And so we're going to bear that in mind very clearly as, uh, as we try and look at this passage and, and understand something of what it says to us today. So in the context of the Old Testament history and Elijah's life, as we've seen, Elijah feels as though his, la his, his labours as a prophet have come to nothing. It looks as if they've all been overthrown again by the enemies. And he, and he comes to the conclusion that uh, he alone in Israel is left and uh, everybody else is apostatized again. God has come to him, of course, and he's shown him his almighty power in those three great signs and wonders. He's spoken to him in that still, small voice. And uh, he's, he's, he's met the God of power and, 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 and sovereign saving gentle grace and, and being personally encouraged by that. But still he returns to that same sense of uh, complete failure. Uh, and that's in verse 14. He repeats his words. I've been very jealous for the Lord of hosts uh, because the children of Israel have forsaken the covenant. They've thrown down the altar, slain the prophets with the sword. And I, only I, am left and they seek my life to take it away. That's that's a a very forlorn and uh, and almost despairing sort of a summary and assessment, isn't it? Now, very interestingly, as we touched upon previously, uh, the Lord now goes on and, and addresses Elijah's concerns by pointing out to him that that he, God, is is about to bring upon the children of Israel who have apostatized, because Elijah's quite right about that. Now, God is about to bring upon them a most stunning. And, and final judgment. Now it's going to have progressive steps in it, this judgment of God, but it's going to result with the ten tribes of Israel being carried away into captivity, never ever to return again as, as a cohesive nation. So this judgment is going to be uh, incredibly uh, uh, all-encompassing and in a sense final for them as a nation. And so he goes through the three different steps of how that judgment is going to take place in verses 15 and following. First of all, Elijah's got to anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Syria will be like the sword of the Lord that smites and slays the children of Israel. God will judge uh, his church through that nation. And he goes on and says, Now Jehu also has to be anointed over Israel, and, uh, and Jehu is going to be the one who, in a sense, mops up the rest and slays them with a sword. And if there's anybody left, uh, he goes on and says, Now anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, to be the prophet in your room, and whoever's left from Hazael and from Jehu, Elisha, uh, will slay. So that, that uh, seems, doesn't it, uh, to be as if the Lord has agreed with Elijah and said, Well, it's all over. Uh, it's done and dusted. Uh, 
uh, judgment now is going to c- consume the lot. But then in that context, in that context, uh, you get verse 18. Yet, notwithstanding this, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. God has maintained in the midst of this apostasy and, uh, and, and is going to continue and, and maintain and preserve and save a people even as the judgment comes and overwhelms that nation. And Paul calls them the election according to grace. And so that's what we're going to look at. There, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. 7,000 who don't bow the knee, and uh, we'll see their distinguishing characteristics and hopefully something of the timeless message that this passage of God's word gives to us. Well, first of all, there is a remnant, and uh, that remnant is described here as 7,000 in Israel who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now that term uh, that Paul uses in Romans 11 to summarise what we have here, uh, remnant, uh, is a very important word and an important concept in the, in, in the Bible, in the Holy Scriptures. And uh, if we were to try and just give a very simple little meaning for what we understand by remnant, uh, the idea is, is this, that it's a, it's, a, it's a small number of people, a small number of people who God saves alive uh, when the rest of the visible church and even mankind is destroyed because of their sins. That's the idea of it. A small number of people that God chooses out and preserves safe and alive while judgment sweeps everybody else away. That's the remnant. Now, just so you get a feel for that, if you open your Bible briefly to to Isaiah chapter 1, um, you, you, you can see there the way this word is used. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 9 <coughs> uh, by the way, in the book of Isaiah, this is a you know, almost a, a continual theme and refrain uh, that the remnant of God, the remnant of grace is preserved by God. So, but here in chapter 1, verse 9, uh, we read, Except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. And we know what happened to them, don't we? Utterly destroyed by a judgment from God. So the remnant, very small number, is preserved alive. And, uh, and that is what the Lord promises uh, to do. Isaiah chapter 37 is another place where you can see clearly how the word is used. And uh, there in verse 31 and 32, uh, we read, And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. So like a tree planted. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that are escaped out of Mount Zion and the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. Now Paul calls the 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to, to bow the remnant according to the election of grace. And that's what he's talking about. The, the, the number of souls that the Lord has lifted up, lifted out, set apart and now preserves alive uh, so that the judgment does not destroy them. That's, uh, that's, uh, I say to you again, that's, the, that's a, a concept that is fundamental to our understanding of the Old Testament scriptures and indeed the Bible itself. God is dealing with a great number of people through his word and his prophecy. Uh, but not everybody that God comes to and speaks his word and prophecy concerning Christ to is saved. But there will always be 
and under God's dealings through his word and gospel, there will always be a remnant according to the election of grace that is saved and preserved alive. And that's what's being brought out to us here. In, in Elijah's day, uh, the visible church, which was Israel, the, the nation of Israel, the ten tribes, uh, it, it, it equates to the visible church. Uh, we, we need to understand that. It's not just a nation. It's a nation that it has been set apart to God for his worship and it, and it equates to the visible church in the Old Testament. You've got Judah and Israel. They're, they're the two parts of now the visible church. The ten tribes are, are, are far down the road of apostasy, but they are still part of that visible church. And so God has sent his prophet to them to speak the word to them and to deal with them as he did on Mount Carmel and to bring them, call them at least, uh, to repentance and to reformation. This is the visible church. Now, now one of the things that, that comes out to us here about the remnant and, and the church is that, is that the visible church, though it be very much a wonder work of God in the midst of the world, and we should notice that, shouldn't we? The visible church is not just like the Lions Club or the Rotary or some other thing that people originate to do good in society. Uh, the visible church is a wonder work of God. It's produced by his grace and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's God's work in the world. It's his special providence and grace that produces the church. It's his special providence and grace that preserves the church within the fallen world. The, the church, the visible church, the worshipping church, uh, is the visible manifestation of the spiritual kingdom of Jesus Christ in the midst of the, of the spiritual kingdom of darkness that's ruled by Satan. And so if, if you have a picture in your mind, after the fall, the world is just a, a dark place. And, and spiritual darkness rules over all and pervades everything. And into the midst of that darkness, God speaks the word of the gospel, of his covenant. And, and it's like a beam of, 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 of bright, powerful light that shines from heaven. And, and as it shines into heaven, it addresses Adam and, and it produces a church by grace. Now, th now that church that was begun uh, outside the garden when God came to Adam and gave the promise of Jesus Christ and produced a people uh, that is looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ and what God has promised, that church, all down through the Old Testament with all its steps and stages of development, was the visible church in the world and it's God's wonder work. It's produced by God and by his grace. And we must not forget that. And still today, in the New Testament age, the Christian church, the visible church, is produced by God. It is preserved by God. It, it, is, the, it is the special focus of God and, and, and of his work and of his attention in the midst of the world. And, and in our day and age, when the church is looked at in such... A, 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 a poor and belittled light and is despised by so many. We ought not forget that. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be flash. It has to be the place where God is gathering his people by his grace in Jesus Christ through the truth. So that church is a wonder work of God. And uh, he preserves it. And, uh, and, and he gives to all the members of it all their special privileges. Now, the children of Israel in the Old Testament had very, very special privileges because they were part of the visible church. Let me just read to you from our, from our larger catechism in our Westminster Confession of Faith for a moment. Just to remind you, of, or, to, or to perhaps introduce you, if the case may be, uh, to something about this visible church. What, what is the visible church? Larger Catechism 64. The, in, uh, the, the, the visible church 
is a society made up of all such as in all ages and places of the world do profess the true religion and of their children. So believers and their children are part of the visible church, like we are here today. We come as believers and our children come with us and, and, and we are the visible church. Okay, well, what special privileges belong to uh, the visible church and to you as, as members of it, people who are part of it? Well, the visible church has the privilege of being under God's special care and government. That's what I was just trying to say. And of being protected and preserved in all ages notwithstanding the opposition of all enemies. So the, the devil and the gates of hell and every engine that's brought against the church can never prevail because God's preserving it. And, and it goes on. And of enjoying the communion of the saints. You've got fellow believers that you're to, thrown together with in the church and you can encourage one another. And it goes on. You also have the ordinary means of salvation. You don't find that outside the visible church. You have the ordinary means of salvation. And then listen to this. And of the offers of grace by Christ to all the members of it in the ministry of the gospel, testifying that whosoever believes in him shall be saved and excluding none that will come unto him. Now that's something like what we heard this morning, isn't it? as we come to worship our God. Now that, that's the visible church, and that's the privileges that belong to the, to the visible church, and that's what Israel was in the Old Testament. And uh, that's why Paul, when he takes that up, applies it as he does, as the election, as, as the remnant according to the election of grace. This is the church that's, that's being addressed here. And brethren, we're part of it. It's an amazing thing, just like... Elijah was part of it in the Old Testament. You and I are part of it today. This wonder work of God in the midst of the world called the visible church. Now, here's the, here's the complication of this, and this is why the remnant according to grace is so, so very important. As the visible church comes into existence in the history of the world, generation by generation, the visible church is not simply made up of those who are true believers. The visible church is a mixture of true believers and counterfeit or false believers. Okay? Now we say to ourselves, oh, wait a minute, pastors, does that mean there might be someone here that's not a true believer? Well, you know, my answer to that is, oh, yes, indeed it does. Now, the church is looked at as the visible church. It's a special place where God's at work. But as the church develops, as people are born into the families of believers and are baptised and take their place in the church, the children come into the church, and we know by observation and from the word of God that there are both, as it was in, in, in the families of the patriarchs, there are both elect and non-elect in our children. There are some who are like Jacob's, elect children of God, children of promise, who come to faith under God's sovereign grace and be saved. And there are Esau's, who will grow up in exactly the same circumstances, in the same family setting, under the same means of grace, with the same word of God addressed to them, and they will be unbelievers from the moment of their birth until they die, and they'll reject the truth. And they, are, and they are thrown together and grow together in the one church. The visible church is a mixture of true and false believers. And that shows in our own children. It is not the case that all the children of believers are necessarily the elect of God, and will come to faith. That's a solemn reality. But now, not only that, but when you think about the visible church as it's gathered now in the New Testament age, this wasn't so much the case in the Old Testament, it was mainly in the line of generations that the church grew 
But in the New Testament, where the church is commanded to go out and preach the gospel to every creature, well, you think of the parable of our Lord Jesus that says that the gospel is like a net cast into the sea. And, it, and as that net is dragged through the sea, it gathers fish, uh, which are like people who are, are gathered up by the gospel into the church. And, and in that net, there's good fish and bad fish. You remember that? And uh, as it's drawn up onto the beach and the disciples observe this, the Lord Jesus says, now you leave those fish, they'll be sorted out by the angels come the judgment day. They're going to be in the net together, in the church together. And that means that they will be gathered into the visible church, in the New Testament church today, not only those who are not regenerate as children, but those who come in professing to believe, but they don't really believe. There's not really a work of grace in their heart. They've come for some other reason. But they're in the church. Now, when you throw those things together, as it was in the time of Elijah, and a process of apostasy has taken place, and, and, the, and the whole trend and thrust of the church uh, for generations upon generations has been to forsake the truth as it is in the Lord Jesus Christ and to embrace a, a life of worldliness and, and the worship of Baal. As, as, as that unfolds, the, the visible church can have a vast majority of people in it that are unbelievers. And, w and where that, that vast majority of people are unbelievers, uh, that church will be swept away, uh, like Israel was, into the worship of Baal. And even when God does most remarkable things in their midst, like he did on Mount Carmel, bringing fire down from heaven, it still won't move them. Because that vast majority of unbelievers in the midst is as dead as dead can be. And, and, and they don't just worship Baal because they've chosen a different religion. They worship Baal because they love sin and he provides it freely for them. That's the whole direction in life. And nothing will move them from it except, except that they have a new heart given to them, that they be born again, that they be converted from Baal to God. That's the only thing that will make the difference. And, 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 and the majority of people, as it sweeps the church away like that, and here's the sobering truth, the majority of people that sweep a church away like that and the church that's involved in it is headed for judgment. It's headed for judgment. The Word of God tells us that judgment will begin with the house of God and then God will move on from the church to judge all those who are outside. Judgment will begin with us. And like it was with Israel, God is preparing the judgment. He's already said to Elijah, you go and anoint Hazael. You go and anoint Jehu. You go and anoint Elisha. They will bring the judgment. It's coming to the visible church. And like I said at the beginning, when that judgment rolls over them like a, a flood, an overwhelming flood against which none of them can stand, uh, then they will be called to account uh, for all that they've done and for their unbelief. And, uh, and there'll be none to stand between them and God because they never, ever put their trust in the mediator that he had provided, Jesus Christ. Now, brethren, that's exactly what's going on. Now, the remnant in the midst of that, uh, in, in that visible church, God has a remnant according to the election of grace. Now that is not the visible church so much, it's the invisible church. Now they're found in the visible church, but, but this is what we call the invisible church. It's the elect of God in the midst, and it's those who are brought to true and saving faith in the midst of the church. Let me read to you from our larger catechism about the invisible church. This is the, the answer to the question, what is the invisible church? The invisible church is the whole number of the elect. We'll talk about that in a moment. <coughs> the whole number of the elect that have been, are, or shall be gathered into one. 
under Christ the head. And to those elect within the visible church, the special, special benefits of God's electing grace are bestowed. And that's what makes the difference. That is what produces the church of Jesus Christ. Because God has his elect and God's grace is going to call and produce those, the elect church as he gathers those people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything is for them. Everything that God gives to the visible church is for the sake of those elect. They're the remnant according to the election of grace. And, and Isaiah, uh, Elijah has his eye upon them and he, and he calls them the 7,000 in Israel who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So if you were to think for a moment about them, that remnant is produced by grace. This is so important for us to understand this. That there, there is a remnant of people within the visible church, a greater or lesser number at any given time in the history of the church, but a remnant in comparison to a small number there is a remnant that is produced by grace. And that grace, as Paul shows us, flows out of election. A lot of Christians today uh, don't want anything to do with election, uh, not in its biblical form and sense. They think it militates against everything that is to do with man's respect and freedom. But if you take election away out of the Bible and out of our Christian faith, you really have no Christian faith and you have no church that say it, it, it is out of the fountain of electing grace that every saving benefit flows to us dead sinners. It is out of electing grace as the fountain of life that salvation flows into this world and produces a saved people. Now, now that's so important for us to understand. Now, if you turn your Bible with me for a moment uh, to, to Ephesians chapter 1, I'd just like to uh, very briefly uh, identify this crucial passage in the Word of God as something that you can go on and think and study a little more, hopefully, yourselves. But uh, the election that's biblical is, is shown very clearly here in uh, chapter 1. Now, just so you understand, uh, there are many in the Christian church today that say that God chooses out people for salvation on the basis of what those people have done. Okay? So it's as if God looks down through the telescope of eternity into the future and he, and, he, and he observes that there are some people when they hear the truth of the gospel who, who exercise their native ability and goodness uh, to move their own wills to receive and accept the Lord Jesus. Um, that's the doctrine uh, of Arminianism. That's, it's a false doctrine. It's actually a heresy. Because what that does is that it turns election into a reward of, of works. Because if God is looking down through the history of the world to see who chooses him and who doesn't, then it makes everything dependent, doesn't it, upon the will of man. And it implies, doesn't it, that man has a natural ability in him to do good and to choose the good and to save himself in response to God's word. Whereas, in fact, the whole of Scripture tells us that that's not the case. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and following, you can look at it for yourself. It, it says there's none good, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. Uh, there's, there's, there's nobody that will choose God. Romans chapter 9 tells us that it's not we who choose God, it's God who chooses us. It's God's mercy towards people who are dead in trespasses and sins that produces a believer. And so when God looks into the future and to see who will respond uh, 
to his word and who he will choose, he will never ever find someone who would choose him. All he will ever find as he looks into the future to see what we will do in response to the gospel is he will see stubborn, hard-hearted rebellion and wickedness. Unbelief. And so God does not choose on the basis of what we do. God chooses people who don't deserve the least mercy. He chooses some sinners unto salvation and he bestows grace upon them. Now, do you look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. According as he has chosen us in him, that's Christ. When? Before the foundation of the world. Why? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So that's an amazing purpose of God there. And then it goes on and explains it a bit more. He's done this, having predestinated us. Predestination is to, is to set the end from the beginning. And th- this is the destination he's going to give us to. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. On what basis? According to the good pleasure of his will. Who will get the praise? To the praise of the glory of his grace. Grace is his undeserved favour to people who deserve the opposite. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he's made us accepted in the beloved. He made us accepted, not we ourselves. And and so that's an incredibly important passage. And uh, when it comes to that decisive question of whether or not God chooses us according to what we've done, responds to our works and says, you'll do, you're good enough, you've done what I require, or whether God chooses us contrary to our deserving and unconditionally. Uh, Romans chapter 9 is very, very important. So just turn your Bible to Romans 9 for a moment. It's talking in Romans chapter 9 about the two sons. Two sons that are given uh, to Abraham and Sarah. And then to Rebecca in verse 10. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, uh, from the, for the ch- notice this, for the children being not yet born. Okay, do you get the picture? Two boys in the womb. They're not born yet. They haven't done anything. The children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. And so so you get this electing sovereignty of God. Uh, for his own name's sake and according to his own eternal purpose and grace, he has chosen some unto eternal life, like a Jacob, and he has passed by others and left them in their sins, like an Esau. That's what Paul's talking about. That's what produced the 7,000 who didn't bow the knee to Baal. That God had chosen. 7,000 in Elijah's day and made them the objects of his grace and out of that saving, electing grace he had produced a change in their life. Now, now here's the thing that I'd sort of like to focus upon and and help you sort of hopefully uh, lay hold of this afternoon. In In our reformed circle and context, it's often emphasized that God's sovereignty uh, is displayed in both election and reprobation. And that's true. Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. God has chosen some to eternal life and God has passed by others 
and left them in their sins. And the only explanation for that is that it was pleasing to God that he should do so and that it would manifest both his mercy and his sovereign justice and wrath. Now, the scripture shows us that. But now, this is what I'd like you to, to, to really lay hold of, if you possibly can. When it comes to people being reprobated, as we would say, they are left in their sins. They are passed by with mercy. They are left in their sins. Now, here's the point. God does not add anything to them. God does not work anything in them or for them. God has left them as they are so that, so that they are going then in the way of their own conduct, sins and unbelief to receive a just judgment for their own sins. Now, reprobation does not add anything positive to a fallen human being. And then if you think to yourself, well, wait a minute, Pastor, did, did not the word of God in Romans 9 say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Well, yes, it does. But what's being spoken of there is not an intervention directly of God's spirit in a person's heart to make them an unbeliever. Not that at all. That's their own sins. But what's being spoken of when it talks about the hardening of someone's heart is that God gives a good gift to a bad person and they make a bad use of his good gift. It, 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 it's, it's like fertilising a prickle in your paddock. It'll grow bigger and stronger. God doesn't add anything that makes them sinful. God gives a good gift to a sinful person like a pharaoh and he hardens his own heart and God is sovereign in that process. So God doesn't add anything to any unbeliever. But now here's the thing. God adds everything to the elect. Election is a fountain of grace. Election is a producing thing. Election is a, is a fruitful thing. Election is a powerful thing. Out of election, out of God's choosing some to eternal life in Jesus Christ, the Son of God comes into the world because he's the redeemer of God's elect. Out of election, God causes the gospel to be preached throughout the whole world and he accompanies that gospel with the power of his Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit, the spirit of electing grace, accompanies the gospel, God adds everything to the, to the hearer of the gospel who's going to be saved. Now, if you've been saved, somewhere along the line, God in his providence has gathered you up in all the circumstances of your life and he's brought you under the gospel. And for some reason, probably surprising and unknown to you, that something happened in your heart. And it's made you different. You might differ from your brothers or your sisters. They might have heard the same thing or something similar and they've had no similar response to you, uh, to that message. What accounts for that? Well, that comes to you straight out of the election according to grace. God gave you to Jesus Christ and Christ to you in election. And God has brought Jesus Christ to you through the gospel and God has applied him to your heart by the Holy Spirit. And God has changed your heart. God has added something to you. God has done something in you. God has produced something, in a sense, from you out of the ruination of your sin. God has made you a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's God's grace. And that comes straight out of the fountain of election. Election adds everything. Everything that's good. Everything that's saving. Everything that lifts you up out of your sin and will carry you to heaven comes to you out of the fountain of God's electing grace in Christ Jesus. So let's please have that clear. There's a vast difference between the way God is operating through reprobation and election. They're not, they're not to be held, as it were, in a, in a, in a perfect parity. One election is God's active saving grace. 
and, and reprobation is men who are unfolding their own damnation in the way of their own sins because they were left in them. And when they come to the judgment, they're never going to be able to say, God, you did something. No, everything that's done that leads them to destruction is done by themselves. And when it comes to salvation, everything that leads us into glory is done by God through Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit for us and in us. Now, that's an amazing thing. That's why when Elijah looks at the election according uh, to grace, and he sees that remnant, that remnant is distinguished by this. They have not bowed the knee to Baal. They have not kissed the idol of Baal. Because that grace of God, that electing grace, is a transformative power. And it's come... God has come by his grace and truth into their hearts and lives and he has changed them. He's, he's, he's produced believers, he's produced holy people, saints, they're not perfect yet, that waits heaven, but he's produced people in whom there is a genuine beginning of, of, of every grace. And, and throughout the whole of their being, body and soul, with all its faculties, in their mind and their affections and their will, there's new life in them. And, 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 and when it comes to the church of Jesus Christ, that's the people, the remnant according to the election of grace, those people who've been brought alive in Jesus Christ, they're the people who are going to stand up against the heretic who brings the doctrine of falsehood, of falsehood like a Baal worshipper or like a prophet of Baal, they're going to stand up against the false doctrine and they're going to say, no, we, we cannot go there. We cannot possibly embrace that foreign falsehood because we know our God. Not just because we know our doctrine, not just because I've read the Puritans and the Reformers, but I know my God. I know the truth because I've experienced the power of it by his electing grace. God has come to me in my life and he's transformed me when I was dead in trespasses and sins. Don't talk to me about native goodness and the free will of man. I know that God's saving grace transforms dead sinners because I experienced it. That's the sort of people uh, who will stand up against the falsehood of Arminianism. There'll be a doctrinal debate. There'll be a component where the truth is proved from Scripture and there will be logic uh, attached. But when it comes right down to it, the people who hold to the truth against that prevailing error are people who are the remnant according to the election of grace. They have experienced the power of grace in their life. And it's the same, brethren, in, in our Australian society today, who are the people uh, in the Christian church who look at what's happening in the society uh, with, with, with the gay rights movement and, and, and with the abandonment of Christian marriage and, and with the debauchery on every side, with the drunkenness and, and, and with the unruly behaviour of all? Who are, who are the people who say, from my heart, I cannot bow down and serve that God. I cannot bow down and kiss that way of life. I cannot serve Baal. They are the people in the church who are the remnant according to the election of grace because grace produces that holiness in their life. Now, the message of this for us this afternoon, I think in, in large part, is this. Don't think you can bank uh, your church membership and your association with the visible church as your ticket to heaven. There are a great number in Israel in the time of Elijah who were not among that 7,000 but considered themselves as children of Abraham. The thing that distinguishes the elect according to grace that shows them to be part of that remnant is that they will not bow the knee to Baal.
There is prevailing power of grace in their life that's come to them from God. And that's what we need to look for in our life. Do you have that new heart? Do you have that complete abandoned commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ that faith gives to a born-again Christian? Do do, 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 Do you have a prevailing power of holiness at work in your life so that you will not go along with everything that society throws up and makes legal? Are you a person who's bound by your conscience to walk with your God no matter what it costs you? These are the distinguishing characteristics. There is a real difference to someone who's been born again. There's a, there's a, there's a, a graciousness produced in the heart of every one of those remnant according to the election of grace. So we need to be very sen- sensible, sensitive to that. And uh, in conclusion, let me encourage you. Uh, wherever God is at work, by his word and spirit, that is the fruit that will be produced. And, and because God is at work in the world, by his word and spirit, there will always be a Christian church. There will always be a Christian church till Christ returns because it's produced by God. And even in a time of apostasy, like in the time of Elijah, when almost everybody's going to be swept away into judgment, still, still, there's enough power in the grace of God to produce genuine believers who will not bow the knee to Baal. Thank God for that. And that's our, that's our encouragement, that's our comfort. It's, of course, a challenge to us, but a challenge is healthy. A challenge is healthy. Uh, as we go home this afternoon, let's remember then that Jesus Christ church will, will, will prevail. Nothing can destroy it. And the most important thing for us is that as members of the visible church, we can, with a good conscience before God, close our eyes before we go to sleep, And we can say to him, and I know by the fruits that you've produced in me that I'm one of those elect according to grace. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this afternoon. Uh, It's got complexities to it that stretch our minds many of which we have not really touched on. But it's also, Lord, got a clarity to it that confronts us in our life. We are very really. And uh, for many of us, Lord, we're like the the children of Israel of old that we've been born in and grown up in the Christian church. And uh, all our life has been lived in that visible church. So, Lord, we pray that there might be none of us here today that will have lived in the church and yet be strangers to the power of your grace. Would you please have mercy upon us and according to that sovereignty and that electing mercy, that would, would you work in the hearts of us all either to preserve us uh, or to produce a genuine Christianity in us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing in closing.